Coming up this hour, Pastor Mark Driscoll joins me to talk about his book, A Call to Resurgence. That and more this hour on The Janet Mefford Show. The Janet Mefford Show. As Christians in this dark culture, we have got to stand for what is right. I believe that marriage is the union between a man and a woman. I have a lot of beliefs, and I live by none of them. I think same-sex couples should be able to get married. The great thing about the Bible is it never evolves. Do we really think that we can have it both ways? That God will protect us in a time of crisis, even as we turn away from Him in our day-to-day life? If the Word of God says it, I believe it! That's the way it is. And now, here is Janet Mefford. Well, thank you so much for joining us. Several weeks ago, Dr. John MacArthur held his Strange Fire conference out at his church in California, Grace Community Church. And this was a conference, as we know, that took a biblical look at the modern charismatic movement and examined some of its theology and practices against the Word of God. Now, this drew a lot of reaction, as you can imagine, from the charismatic community, as well as from other Christians who believe that the gifts are still viable in our own day. But oddly enough, as much controversy as came out of that conference, one of the bigger stories to also come out of the conference actually didn't occur inside the church. It occurred outside the church in the parking lot. Um, Pastor Mark Driscoll from Mars Hill Church in Seattle ended up coming to the conference to hand out copies of his new book and was soon embroiled in a controversy of his own over the appropriateness of the appearance as well as the truth about what really happened during that encounter with the security staff. So today we have with us today Pastor Mark Driscoll, and we're going to be talking a little bit about Strange Fire because I know that's on a lot of people's minds and also his new book called A Call to Resurgence, Will Christianity Have a Funeral or a Future? Mark, thank you so much for being here today. Sure. Yeah, glad to do it. All right. Let's clear these things out here about Strange Fire, because a lot of people have questions about what happened there, and I'm anxious to get your side of the story. Why was it you decided to go out there in the first place? Um, I was in the area. I uh, had a men's conference in Long Beach, and I was on my way to pick up my sons at the airport, and they were coming down to go do a men's event with me. So um put out on social media the day before, hey, you know, conference is going on nearby, might swing by tomorrow. Um, I showed up. People were super, super nice. The staff, uh, some of the guys who were there on staff and running security and parking welcomed me. They moved the barriers so I could park and visited with me for a while. And I went during a break for about, I don't know, maybe 30 minutes stayed outside, met, got to meet uh, Dr. MacArthur's son, got to meet his executive pastor, got to meet some of his staff. They were very kind, very nice. Um, Got to pray for some pastors, some folks who were planting churches and stuff. Some pastors just had questions about, I'm thinking about planting in Italy, or I'm thinking about planting in Guatemala, and what do you think about that? Um, And then uh, there was a little confusion with a couple security guys. When the session started, I didn't want to interrupt the event, so um, got back in the car and went home. So um, probably wasn't as exciting as um, the uh, the telephone game that ends up being played on the Internet. But, but yeah, the folks that I met from the staff um, were very, very nice. Okay. Well, now, let, did you ever have any idea of actually registering for the conference and attending? No, to be honest with you, um, I was just down in the area a day early and, uh, and read about it online. I'd known... Um, the Pastor John had an event coming up, but to be honest with you, I was going down to speak at my own event, so I, I, I guess I missed the dates, and I was online thinking, well, I'm going to be driving right by there tomorrow, I'll swing by. So no, I hadn't, I mean, I knew about the event, but I, I hadn't put two and two together until the day before when I was down in that area. So did you happen to call the church and let them know, give them a heads up that you were going to be stopping by at all? I put it on social media, which, you know, there's, I don't know, for me, that's 700,000 people, so they... Um, probably wasn't a, a big shock that I was coming. Um, yeah, and with something like that, I've run a lot of events. I don't know if you've done that, but when there's thousands of people um, and they're already there and the event's already going, um, 
can be a little complicated to keep it all together, that's for sure. Sure. Well, because a lot of people have asked about what happened after the event was over. You had tweeted that security confis- you said security confiscated yeah. my books. Did you see the long blog I wrote on that, kind of explaining my appreciation for Pastor John? I read your letter yeah. to John MacArthur, and yeah. I know that you explained your side of the story there, but did they really confiscate your books? Because the video said, we'll give your books back to you, and then you said, I'm going to give them to you as a gift. So were they really confiscated? I'm sorry. I've got the flu this morning, so if I keep coughing, I apologize. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, it's all right. Um, Yeah, yeah, they came up multiple times and told me that they had to be removed from campus and that they were going to remove them and put them in a, I think it was a yellow Mustang, and I I didn't understand that because I didn't didn't have a yellow Mustang. I didn't come in a yellow Mustang. So I I could tell you're a defender of Pastor John. I could tell this is an issue for you, and and what I write about in A Call to Resurgence is this issue of tribalism, Uh that tribes tend to speak about one another rather than with one another, and that there's a lot of uh, speculation and division within evangelicalism. And now that we're a minority group that's not really appreciated in the culture, that we'd be better spent using our time for evangelizing than infighting. And so, you know, it's uh, it's a good opportunity for us to work on that lesson, and uh, that probably includes you and me. Well, I am very interested in truth, and that's part of the reason I wanted to ask you directly, because there was some, you know, it's fair. It's to be fair and to say one side says you didn't tell the truth. You're saying they did confiscate your books. Yeah, yeah. They kept telling me either you need to remove them or we will remove them. And when they said, we're going to take them, I said, well, then go ahead and and keep them. All right. Hang on just a moment. We need to go to a quick break. We'll come back with Pastor Mark Driscoll. We're going to talk about his book. It's out, A Call to Resurgence. Don't go away. back on the Janet Mefford Show. Thanks for being with us. My guest is Pastor Mark Driscoll from Mars Hill Church in Seattle. He is out with a new book called A Call to Resurgence, Will Christianity Have a Funeral or a Future? Now, Mark, you make this point, which I think is a very sound thesis when you say that Christendom, as we know it, or cultural Christianity is dead, and that you fear for the future of Christianity. Why is that? Well, I think for a long time, if you'd ask most people, you know, what percentage of Americans are Christian that say, oh, 40, 60, you know, the impression was that Christianity was big and powerful and going well. More recently, the real statistics indicate it's 7 to maybe 8.9% of those who don't just uh, profess they're a Christian because they got baptized as a kid or go every Easter, but those who really believe the Bible and believe in Jesus. And so, um, you know, we are not nearly as uh, large a group as maybe we would have had anticipation of. And, uh, and I think this happened very, very suddenly. And I think we're seeing younger people trend away from Christian faith, urban people trend away from Christian faith. And I think also you're seeing the culture become increasingly hostile to Christian values very, very quickly. And the question is, well, what, what's the church going to do? How are we going to respond? What's our position? Um, you know, should we cave in and compromise doctrine and truth and, and what the Bible teaches? Should we try and take back America and make it a political war? And I think a lot of evangelicals are, are having those kinds of, of conversations and concerns right now. And that's really kind of the bullseye for what I'm getting after in the book. Right. Now, you also talk in your book about the new paganism, which I think is a really important point. What can you tell us about that? Yeah, Dr. Peter Jones has done a lot of work on this, and uh, really, Romans 1 says there's the creator, and then there's the creation. And what happens is, is when we confuse or trade the creator for the creation, all kinds of all kinds of error starts to come in. All of a sudden, you don't see a difference between God and the world. So you end up being a pantheist or panentheist or radical environmentalist. You don't see a distinction between God and man. You don't see a distinction between human beings who bear God's image and animals, and that leads to all kinds of confusion. And you don't see the difference between angels and demons. They end up with twilight and vampires and, and this entire dark side of spirituality that young women in particular are trending toward. You don't see a difference between men and women, and then you end up with homosexuality and so it's like that first domino. When you get rid of the distinctions that God makes, all of a sudden um, morality and truth just disappear. 
Well, you're right. We do face those sorts of challenges. Now, it's interesting. I'm glad that you mentioned Dr. Jones, because as people will know, he is the foremost evangelical scholar on the rise of neo-paganism, has coined the terms twoism and oneism, which you mentioned in your book. Now, I was reading your book in preparation for the interview, and when I came across this section on the new paganism, I was a little interested to note that you didn't quote him and you didn't footnote him. You have a footnote after the first sentence where you mentioned twoism and oneism, and it says, see, for example, Truth Exchange and Peter Jones' book one or two. But then you go on for several more pages and you never footnote him. Why? Um, I, Peter Jones is actually a friend of mine. I've had dinner with him a lot. His wife is really great, too. She is a really smart, um, great gal. In my book, Doctrine, I talk a lot about his concepts. In this book, I took his big idea and worked it out through the cultural implications, but I wasn't working specifically from his text, but uh, I think Peter would tell you I love him a lot. We're good friends, and I've learned a lot from him. Most of what I learned from him was actually sitting down over meals and him talking and me listening, um, and I should have been taking notes. That would have been a little easier to footnote. Right, except don't you think that it's important when you're using somebody else's material that you should footnote the person? Yeah, and I did mention Peter Jones. Go see these two books, and this is where it's all at. Well, yes, I've, you have not interv- And I've yeah. interviewed Peter Jones online, and I've run his blogs, and I've had him speak at conferences, and I mean, I, I, I certainly love and appreciate him. And, and if, I, if I made a mistake, then I apologize to Dr. Jones, my friend. I, I love him. I appreciate him, and that was not my intent, for sure. Well, yeah, because you did, and I'm, I'm mentioning this because I think it's really important. When you have this endnote number five under Chapter 2, you say, see, for example, truthexchange.com or Peter Jones in his book, you don't even cite a page number. And it trouble it troubles me though it troubles me though Mark because I've read Peter Jones I know Peter Jones I'm going to be going out to his think tank for the third year this year and I'm reading his material and this is his intellectual property and you don't give him any credit for it I I take his big idea and then I talk about the ways that it works itself out and the cultural issues that I'm addressing and what I would say is you're being accusatory and unkind and I would say ask Dr Jones if what he thinks I mean I. I, I love Peter. I respect Peter. Like I said, Peter's a friend of mine, and, and I've been very public about how much I have learned from him. But I, I thought, um, man, I thought we'd have a better interview than this. It seems like you're having sort of a grumpy day. Oh, I'm not having a grumpy day. I, the problem that I'm seeing here, I was actually really excited to talk to you about the book. In all honesty, Mark, as a Christian, because I have the same concerns you do about cultural Christianity going away and real Christianity needing a revival. Let's and I, talk about that and not a footnote. Let me say I mean, one. Let me say one other thing though it just if if you don't mind um and i'm not trying to be unkind to you but there is another section from page 185 to 189 where you go back to oneism there's no footnote at all to peter jones and at the end you talk about sex as the pagan sacrament of oneism i mean that's directly from his book he has a god of sex book where he has a chapter entitled homosexuality the sexual sacrament of religious paganism this is not your intellectual property i mean this is not just unethical, I think. I think this is something you could be sued under, under copyright law for intellectual property. I'm really concerned from the legal aspect for Tyndale House. I I don't know why you wouldn't footnote him if he's such a good friend. Maybe I made a mistake. Maybe I did, and I I would have to go back. To be honest with you, I'm sitting here with a head cold in the flu trying to do you a favor, and I don't remember footnote on page 183. I thought we were going to talk about the decline of Christianity and the need for the gospel, and I think you're illustrating the big need for the book, that tribes tend to fight over secondary issues, miss primary issues, and the result is infighting instead of evangelizing. I, I don't know how else to say it more clearly. I love you. You're my sister. I, uh, and you want to ask what happened in the editing process? Did an editor miss a footnote? I, I don't know. What I would say is thanks for bringing it to my attention. I'll go double-check You've probably written and know that when you write a book, there's 27 edits and going back and forth, and maybe something accidentally got deleted or a mistake was made. And if so, I apologize for that. But I I have in print in multiple of my books um, quoted, cited Peter Jones, love him, had him for dinner at my house, and he's my friend, and I've learned a lot from him, and I've been open and public about that. I mean, you can Google the well, interviews I've done with him on Resurgence and the yeah. ways that I talk about he's been a great uh, friend. Of well, him. and that all the more reason than you should, that you should have given him credit in that those 14 pages. That's what is more, uh, I think, important to point out. It's not unkind or tribal to point out that you should be honest. I mean, you were recently preaching a sermon, Do Not Steal, on the Eighth Commandment. And I'm thinking of Romans 2.21. If you're going to teach others, do you not teach yourself while you preach against stealing? Do you steal? Now, you're saying it was inadvertent. Are you going to go back to Tyndale House? It was made. It was inadvertent, and I I will follow up on it. But 
see, what I think you're missing is um, there is a difference between making a mistake and committing a sin. And if I made a mistake, I want to make it right. But really, I mean, you boil, you're going to take the entire interview and find what you are critical of and the nail you're going to hammer so that your audience can see you hammer Mark Driscoll today. Mark Driscoll loves Jesus. Mark Driscoll loves you. Mark Driscoll's in the least, one of the least church cities in America preaching Jesus for 17 years, trying to see people get saved. And I was hoping we could help others talk about, man, their kids are now going gay. Their kids are walking away from Christ. Their church is not doing very well. Things are not trending in our direction. And people are concerned. And how could we help them? How could we equip them? How could we love them? How could we serve them? I would rather talk about Jesus than Mark Driscoll. Well, I know, and and I would too, but I think it's an important thing. If we're going to talk about Christianity having a future, I think we not only need to be sound in our doctrine, but I think we also need to be sound in our holiness. And I think if we have wronged... Kindness and love. Yeah, I mean, this is important too. I'm looking at your website here. You have a a, a frequently asked questions section on your website asking, if I use material from one of Pastor Mark's sermons, do I need to cite him as the source of that material? And the answer on your website is yes. If you don't cite him, you are plagiarizing. If you use content from one of Pastor Mark's sermons or from one of his books, you need to attribute the content, whether it is a quote or paraphrase, to Pastor Mark. And you're right about that. But now you're telling me 14 pages of somebody else's intellectual property was inadvertent. I have to take you at your word. Are you going to go back to the publisher and have them fix it? What I will do is double check with Peter Jones. See, you're not an intellectual property attorney or an intellectual property judge, you're rendering a verdict and then you're trying to enforce a sentence. And what I would tell you is, I will check. I appreciate you bringing it to my attention. But insofar as taking your legal advice, I probably wouldn't do that right now. Oh, no, I'm not giving you legal advice. And and I'm not giving me orders in front of an audience. No, I asked you, are you going to go to Tyndale House and fix and have the book fixed? Well, what I will first do is I will go to Dr. Jones, my friend, and if I erred, apologize to him and then make an effort to fix it. Okay. I'm not a publisher, but I will make an effort to make it right if I if I got it wrong. Right. Okay. Well, that's you know fair enough, but I think it's a fair question to ask you. It's a public book. People are going to be reading it. You have an awful lot of people who follow you, and I think it's a fair question. I don't. I don't. I think it's... I think it's rude, and I think the intent behind it is not very Christ-like. But I'll, I'll receive it, and I'll try to receive it graciously and humbly. But I wouldn't allow you to pretend to take a, a generous, gracious, moral gospel high ground. I, I would, I would not, um, I would not just uh, give you a pass on that out of love for you, because I want you to grow as well. And I think, um, I think it's a good opportunity for you to grow as well. Well, I I fail to see how I've been unbiblical in asking you a straightforward question about the content of your book. I, I don't think we need to go ad hominem on me about it. You're you're the one who's going to have to answer for this. It's it's not right what you did, Mark. It's not right you what you did. To ask me about the book, and we sure. started with John MacArthur and went to a footnote. It, you fourteen can pages, fourteen pages of no footnote and no page citation. No, there's a there's a footnote that says that it comes from Peter Jones' work. It says C for example. It doesn't have anything and he has specific a from the book. Think tank and okay. classes at Westminster. His whole life has been dedicated to the issue of you know monism or oneism. Right, right. Well, I just think if he is such a good friend, and I think that that that's great that you guys are great friends. I think that you should have given him the credit. I think that's what a friend should do, and I. This is my point, Mark. We can have sound doctrine all day long, but if we don't act in a godly way, who's going to listen? And that applies exactly to pastors. What I'm saying. Right. And I mean, but that applies to me as a regular sheep, and it applies to you as a pastor. But you're more than a regular sheep. You're a, you've got a large audience, and the Bible says not many should presume to be teachers, and you've got a lot of people listening to you who are learning from you. Well, I'm not teaching. I tend to interview people and take calls, but a uh, fair point that, you know, you're certainly entitled to think that. I think you are on the right track as far as saying we need to do something about this culture, and I think that you are right in saying something's wrong. But I think that it's important when you're getting those ideas out that you do it in an upstanding way. And I, I really hope that you, you are going to fix this because I think it's the right thing to do, and I think it would be a good witness for everybody who's going to read and, uh, you know, look at the ideas in your book. All right. I think we've lost him. That is Mark Driscoll from Mars Hill Church in Seattle. And I guess uh, he has opted out of the interview at this point. You're listening to The Janet Mefford Show, and we'll be coming back. 